Welcome. My name is Marielle Villaray, and I am the Program Development Director for the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation here at the Graduate Center. I'm here in the CUNY TV studios, and I want to thank the incredible staff here for giving me the opportunity to record with their support. Today, we have another installation of our Underscored series. We're so pleased to be partnering with Copeland House and their ensemble on these virtual programs. After the performance, we will do a live Q&A with the audience. We invite your questions and comments throughout the program using the Q&A button at the bottom register of your Zoom window. Before we get to the music, Michael Bariskin, Artistic and Executive Director of Copeland House, will tell us more about what we are listening to today. Thank you for joining us and enjoy. Welcome back for another installment in our virtual series called Underscored in which we spotlight important American pieces of music and their composers past and present. I'm Michael Boriskin, the Artistic and Executive Director of Copeland House, and I'm standing here in Aaron Copeland's studio near New York City to say a few words about today's featured work, which is a sly, terrifically inventive piece written almost 25 years ago by the award-winning composer, Sebastian Courier. Sebastian is really one of the most unconventionally imaginative composers around with a kind of quirky turn of mind. And I mean that only in the very best sense of that term. His music seems to explore ambiguities, opposites, states of mind, even trying in today's featured work to explore in real time an idea and subject from multiple perspectives. Today's piece is called Verge, and it has its origins in a piano vignette by the great German romantic Robert Schumann, a composer whose music like Sebastian's, soars into all kinds of fantastical realms. Uh, Schumann wrote a beloved suite in the mid-1800s called Kinderzenen, Scenes from Childhood, in which there's a little piece called Fast zu Ernst, in German, almost too serious. So that title intrigued Sebastian, who quickly began thinking about what almost too serious might mean. And that broadened out to what he started reflecting on as those boundaries that may be approached, but shouldn't be crossed. And that in turn prompted him to write a whole suite that elaborated on what he called a precarious sense of balance that stands on the edge of excess. Uh, I remember him once saying that standing there on the edge or on the verge was a good place to be both in art and in life, and I certainly couldn't agree more. And indeed, the nine short pieces that make up verge are divided into three groups of three pieces, each beginning with a pair of opposites all of which are on the verge and are pretty perceptible as soon as you hear them. The pieces are titled Almost Too Fast, Almost Too Slow, and then Almost Too Mechanical. Almost Too Dark, Almost Too Light, Almost Too Fractured. And finally, Almost Too Much, Almost Too Little, ending in Almost Too Calm. We at Copeland House have had a long and wonderfully rewarding association with Sebastian, and this piece is actually the very first one of his that Music from Copeland House performed. Uh, we subsequently recorded it as part of a CD we made of four of his chamber works a number of years ago, and we have been playing this piece all over the country. We always have a blast performing it. Uh, it's dazzling and really entertaining, and we hope you'll like it as much as we do. Uh, Sebastian will join us immediately after the performance for a live Q&A when he'll take your questions and respond to your comments. So please gather your thoughts 
as you hear our performance and then st start typing them in via the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen. So we'll see you after the performance. Enjoy.
And as we fade off into inaudibility and another world, um, we're happy to welcome everybody back um, to a conversation uh, that we're very happy to have with the composer of that remarkable work, Sebastian Courier. Welcome, Sebastian. It's good to see you again. Likewise, and thanks for the beautiful performance. I thought it was really stunning. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Well, we've had a long time to get uh, to get this piece right. Um, we've been playing. Sounds that way, so that's that's great. 
We've been playing this piece for a very long time uh, with great delight and to the delight, I have to say, to uh, listeners far and wide. It's a remarkable work. Um, before we get uh, into our, uh, our Q&A and our conversation, uh, just a couple of uh, pieces of uh, housekeeping housekeeping very quickly. First of all, to everybody joining us today, please, uh, just a reminder to use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen uh, and type in your questions and comments and reactions. Um, we'll be very happy to, to have them and to, uh, and to get to them. Uh, there's certainly a lot, a lot to talk about with this um, really, really, imaginative uh, and quite wonderful piece. Uh, the other thing is just a quick reminder uh, that this uh, performance, this program is being recorded and uh, will continue to be recorded throughout the Q&A, but don't let that dissuade you from uh, asking questions at this point. We look forward to hearing from everyone. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, we had one question here already, um, which is good to see. Um, Sebastian, how did you decide on the trio of instruments, this particular trio of clarinet, violin, and piano uh, until what? I guess until uh, the relatively recent past, um, uh, of the last several decades ago, um, this combination wasn't too uh, often come across. Correct. Um, the reason is uh, it was actually a, a commission from the Verder Trio, which which you mentioned the last few decades um, as being as sort of changing things. And um, indeed, they've commissioned many. I don't know how many, probably hundreds of pieces for this. Um, Combination, and I believe it did come, however, from Bartok Contrast, this amazing piece um, that was written in probably the '30s or something like that. And um, so that's how I, I, so that was sort of given to me. Um, but it's a, um, it's a very interesting combination because it's because every color is so distinctly separate, and yet it man manages to blend and balances are pretty good and all of that stuff too. So, so it's, it's um, you know. A medium that should become more of a norm in the chambers of world, for sure. Uh, it's true that we we do have to uh, um, take our hats off to uh, our fellow ensemble uh, out in Michigan, uh, where they've been based for decades. Uh, I think Michigan State University, the right. Bear Bear Trio, as you as you properly said. Um, this is really an instance of. Um, performers really having an impact on the literature. Um, because yes, you, you correctly pointed out that, um, that Bela Bartok, one of the giants of 20th century music, uh, wrote um, a now classic piece for this uh, ensemble of clarinet, violin, and piano. Um, and there were a few other examples, sort of stray examples here and there, but uh, the Verdere trio, which in fact was made up of these three instruments, um, really um, seemed to have decided early on in their uh, ensemble career to commission uh, composers far and wide, as you correctly said, and they've really made a medium, haven't they? Indeed, yeah, they really have. And it's a wonderfully flexible uh, medium as, as well. Um, we've got another question here, um, um, a question which I'm sure lots of people um, have on their minds. Uh, tell us a little bit about those composers that may have influenced you, not only uh, in this piece in particular, but more generally. Um. Let's see. That's always this question, you know. <laughs> You've, I've been asked that question for 25 years, and I still never know exactly how to <laughs> answer and that's, it. But, and that's uh, why people continue yeah, to, to ask, ask it. Indeed. But no, I would say, I mean, first off, I grew up knowing standard repertoire and loving standard repertoire very well. So a, a lot of my life as a composer has been, you know, 
dealing with present times, but also keeping some connection um, to that world of music. So I, I know that very well. Um, you know, we don't have to go over individual composers, we all know who they are. Um, in the 20th century, certainly um, speak of this piece and, and, um, and in general would be Bella Bartok, who's I think a, an amazing composer who manages to have what I consider such an ideal of like between, it's very visceral, even though it's intellectual also. Um, he really, it seems to me of many of the early, early composers of the 20th century managed to get a great balance between those two, um, which is why I think something like his string quartets of, you know, they're pretty naughty stuff in a way, but they're so popular because of course people love them because they have all this incredible energy. They engage with folk music, but then if you know more about them, you know, they're very cerebral too and how they're constructed and so on. Um, so I, I, that, that sort of strain and somebody like Ligeti too, who's again, a Hungarian who comes from that sort of tradition also appeals to me, particularly some of those late, late pieces like the on the etude and so on, because again, they try to engage with the past and make something new from it that seems vital um, and don't feel they have to uh, totally negate it. So, uh, so those would be two who stand out. I mean, and of course, many, many others, but those, those two for the moment we raise in this piece. Well, for sure. And they're both um, real, real, uh, seemingly unend unending, bountiful, uh, resources uh, for uh, not only composers, but performers as well. Um, I was going to ask you a question, if, if I might, um, just to expand a little bit on the notion of Verge, uh, of the piece we just heard, in terms of this the sense of boundaries. I mean, I explained uh, in, in the brief um, intro that you were, I guess, um, sort of inspired by at least the concept of that little Schumann piano piece called um, Almost Too Serious. So can you tell us a little bit more about, about that and finding that that uh, that very narrow space between uh, um, over the line and up to the line. Indeed. Um, so um, first of all, yes, you have to, you know, to, to understand the title of almost too serious, you have to understand that it's it's meant in the context of the whole piece. So as you're hearing these scenes from childhood, largely major key, so on and so forth. This is one that, that just has this different character to it. And of course the idea is, he wants it to stand out, but he doesn't want it to be incongruous. And I think as an artist, that's always what one's up against is like balances how far to push something. And I suppose you could also say that different eras, um, eras, excuse me, are um, defined by their relationship to that. Because I can imagine in the classical period, you know, it's about balance and symmetry and so on. And, and it really defines the 19th century that somebody like Schubert is wanting to push those boundaries. On the other hand, he has this sense of, you know, Form, form and cohesion that he doesn't want to push it too far. Uh, so I think it's always, um, I think this is a good thing. I think it's always an uncomfortable place because one never knows exactly, um, you know, where one's going to go over. And, you know, there's a, there's a line of, of, from uh, William Blake saying something like, um, you know, you've never known what's enough until you've had too much, <laughs> you know? So in a way, maybe, you know, in, in the, in the room, one has to find that out on one's own, you know, privately, and then, um, you know, find that right spot. Uh, for sure. And I guess another thing that, um, that composers come up against is time. Um, and I found that we've been speaking increasingly um, or speaking often in these programs um, with composers about the subject of time. Um, we know that music exists in real time. Composers work on a canvas of, of time. And I wonder, um, tell us about your relationship to time <laughs> in the sense that there are some composers, one, one uh, composer that we featured um, earlier this year, a wonderful um, young composer named Annika Sokolovsky, um, who was a fellow in Copeland House's Emerging Composers Institute, um, 
we premiered a piece that she commissioned, premiered it on this series. She, um, she said, time ruins everything. <laughs> and of course there are some composers like Annika in that particular piece uh, who try to, to break free from time, to escape it, to try to obliterate it uh, in the sense of music that's just floating. Then there are other composers who really try to control it and to emphasize um, the, the, the strength, the, the authority of time. And you seem to have even a, a, a kind of multi-dimensional um, interaction with time because I was just looking before, before we started this program um, down your work list and you've got so many pieces that have time or the notion of time in their titles, nighttime, 15 minutes, quiet time, pulse, static, which can mean both. A lot of work. A piece that we commissioned, uh, time and time, variations on time and time again, which is, was on an imaginary song by that name, clockwork, uh, time machines. So um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about that. I'm a little obsessed, yeah. Well, I mean, um, in answer, I mean, to Anna, I mean, like in a way you could also say, well, nothing at all exists without time. So it's like, it's, it's such a fundamental thing. And the interesting thing is in a way you could say, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but not that much, that music is made of nothing but time, time and air. Um, and the way I mean this is not only are all the formal aspects that unfolds over time, but actually pitch is a function of time too. It's simply the vibration per second, right? And, and also, the timbre of instruments, which are a function of overtones from, um, that are also a, a sense of time. So time is really, really fundamental to music, from my point of view. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's one of the things too I like about music. It's so, it enters inside you. It's both so ephemeral, but also so engaging and moving and so on. Um, and I think there's some relationship between those two things. And, um, and the other thing that interests me about time, which a lot of those pieces relate to that you name, is so time, music unfolds in time, right? But it also shapes our perception of time as it unfolds. Um, and so there's this very dynamic relationship. Um, piece of, piece, one of the pieces you mentioned is called 15 Minutes. It's for um, flute, harp, and viola. And it's 15 movements, each exactly a minute. But I swear your subjective experience is one, oh, that's kind of long actually. Oh, that's kind of short. Oh, that, you know, your feeling of how that minute is used um, can change radically um, based on the material inside it. And um, so I'm, I'm interested also in that very dynamic relationship with time. And then I'm also interested in this idea of, you know, the next aspect of time, I guess would be sort of moving up the scale is narrative and how a piece unfolds, you know, this idea that maybe we, we get on in one place and we get off in another. And that, I mean, the idea of a piece as a journey is something that's always been with me and felt important to me. Not all pieces operate that way, obviously, but that's something that, that appeals to me. That's something in my early days growing up, listening to music, um, you know, Opus 111, right? Beethoven, feels like a journey, right? You end up somewhere different than you started. Um, and, um, you know, a writer like Virginia Woolf is like privy to that because she uses that piece in her in her um, in her novel Voyage Out um, as a sort of emblematic of that idea of movement somewhere, you know, not being able to go back, um, starting one place and then somewhere else. Right. Well, and you mentioned something um, which gets to my question about one of those. I don't want to say options, but one, one of those approaches about controlling time and one of the ways that composers control time, you certainly do in this piece as well as in so many others, whether we're speaking chronologically or not, is the reaction that we have. Uh, when you were talking about your piece, 15 minutes, where each piece is a minute long, but you have a different sense 
right. of that. Um, I mean, that gets demonstrated pretty, pretty vividly in Verge. Um, and one of the things that I was always struck by was how uh, you title a piece almost too much and how you can make the listener feel that it's almost too much after only three minutes, which is about as long as that piece is, um, which has to do, I should think, less with chronological time, but more with what has happened in the music and the texture and the intensity and the, the nonstop drive, yes? Um, absolutely, and it's about scale too. It, it's, it's sort of amazing how we unconsciously sort of do that. The reason it feels like a lot, I mean, there's other reasons too, but the move, other, other movements are shorter. It's as simple as that. And this, in the context of the pacing of other movements generally, this seems like really large. And that's why, and also almost too little seems so incredibly brief ne next to that, um, almost too, almost too much, right? Um, yes. So, um, yeah, and that, that is an interesting thing. I have another piece that reminded me too of microsynth, which the idea there is um, to take a whole big Mahler length symphony and squeeze it into just 10 minutes. Because I think there are some aspects where we can sort of tell scale too, because we have certain expectations in a classical symphony of something to unfold in a certain amount of time. And if we speed that up or, um, or slow that down, then we have some, different sense, we, we can sort of gauge that. Um, so I think there's all sorts of interesting dynamics when can, you know, as things unfold in time. I just, I wanna, we, we have time, uh, I think just for, to, to talk about one other thing. And, and I wanted to circle back to what you said about music being a kind of journey. Um, because I remember reading something and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that, when you, you came to classical music in a sort of roundabout way uh, through rock and through your being a guitarist when you, were, when you were young. And I think I remember either talking to you about this or reading somewhere about your saying that one of the things that sort of turned you towards concert music because uh, I hate the term classical music, but to turn, turn to concert music uh, from the field of rock and pop was that you were able in concert works, in grander scaled concert works to take this journey, an emotional and sonic journey. Could you just tell us a little bit about what First of all, do I have that correct? And second of all, if I do have it correct, what did you mean by that? Sure. Um, yes, you have it correct, I think. And, um, you know, your typical pop or rock song, I mean, it should be totally incredible, but I think it's sort of generally the way they work is they're made to hold on to some feeling, some affect, some point of view. Um, and they tend to sustain it. There's, there's moderate changes in between. It's a matter of uh, timing too, if it's only a few minutes long, what you know, how much can happen. Um, and you can compare that to, yes, as a kid, you know, we my parents were both musicians, um, and my brother and I, who was you know, in this rock band together, and we'd end up um, listening to all their records. And you know, the difference between that and then you put on, you know, a Beethoven piano sonata or a Mahler symphony, and it's this whole different, it's a totally different viewpoint of time and this notion of journey it's not about sustaining just this one idea quite the contrary it's about beginning one place and taking you somewhere else in the case of you know classical period usually you right, it drops you off back where you started right in the case of a model symphony you know god knows you're in some other country or place when you're done um and so that always very interests me and it's sort of you know it is more like the narrative of a novel or something like that um versus let's say a pop song is more like a lyric poem or something it's a saying something so yes that that's always been something that's been important to me and seems very rich and i think um again for want of a better word classical you know um, contemporary music or any any classical music its nature is to be quite wide emotionally and so it's very good at doing that too because um, you can feel 
you have a palette where you can go almost anywhere um, is what it feels like. And that gives you that option for exploring this, these different journeys. Um, yeah, I'm fascinating, fascinating, uh, obviously. I mean, and especially throughout the 19th century, the canvas that composers worked on kept on expanding and expanding and expanding to the point that, um, you know, by the end of the century and the, what's called the high romantic period, um, composers were, um, I don't want to say frequently, but uh, composers were now expanding uh, the canvas of orchestral works to, uh, you cited Mahler, Gustav Mahler a number of times to works that were an hour long or longer. Um, and so that's a lot of time to fill and a lot of sort of subject matter and expressive context, uh, content to, to fill out. Uh, we have another, one more question which I think came to us uh, from a Facebook listener. Um, this is actually two questions. Um, how did you decide on the order of the movements, which we haven't spoken about? Um, were you pairing them by contrast or by creating a larger narrative structure? Um. The answer is yes. Like that is <laughs> that is actually actually both, right? I mean, the thing is to both. Um, you're right, absolutely right. With those dialectics, they're they're in in sharp contrast to each other. So that always happens for sure. Um, but then in the things we were talking about, the overall structure with putting almost too much where it is, and so on and so forth. Those aspects unfold or almost come at the end create this larger scale. So I sort of wanted to have both of those dynamics um, operate at the same time. And what about, I mean, the specific order itself? Uh, we've, so now you've talked about the um, sort of grouping them together uh, right. to create a larger narrative. Right. Um, but what about the other part of this question? I'm not gonna let you off the hook. Um, and I'm sure Pietor, who gave us this question, would love to know that too. Just the sequence of the way you've organized it. Right. Um, I mean, you know, to some extent, you know, one's just working it out as one goes. But one of the obvious things of it is, as you mentioned, the sort of triplets of having this dialectic, but then breaking that, and therefore it. it forms these groups of three um, that sort of build up over time is the way I looked at it. In terms of, you know, you could, yes, could I, beginning very fast, I mean, that was just a choice in terms of the, the feeling of the piece to suddenly be in the middle of it and have this intensity to play off of, um, you know, but does, how does that relate to the whole thing? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. At some point, folks, you know, you can't answer exactly. Um, I would say the most most of the thing is a sense of um, I think they get more involved over time, and so so it, in a sense there's a greater complexification or something like that. That um, by the time we get to the third triplet of pieces, um, is more you know my reasons for which set I would do. Like if I did almost too dark and almost too light first, that seems a little. The scale of it, the nature of it, seem, it doesn't seem quite appropriate somehow. The almost too fast brings you into the piece um, more. Um, the almost too fragmented can only occur, fractured, excuse me, only too fractured, can only occur later because I had to fracture all the other movements. You know, so certain things dictated that um, the way they were structured. So and you can't fracture something. Um, you're pre fractured. Right? Unless you've heard it before. Exactly, right. So, and yeah. I mean, certainly as a performer, uh, you know, uh, I and my colleagues um, have all felt, always felt the variety of the individual pieces and the pacing throughout the piece, the entire work, uh, is just terrific. I mean, you start with this coup de théâtre, this, uh, uh, you know, theatrical swoosh of the first, uh, you know, the first piece almost too fast. I mean, what a great curtain raiser on the set that is. 
and the variety throughout is terrific. And to end by just sort of floating off into another world is, is, really, is really terrific. Um, look, it's always great talking to, to you, Sebastian. We've known each other a very long time. We could, we could keep this going uh, for the rest of the afternoon, I, I have no doubt. Um, it's, it's so wonderful that, uh, that you were able to, to join us. Always great to talk to you. Um, I just, I just want to, uh, mention to our viewers that we will be back in the new year. Um, we'll have a little bit of a break through the holidays and getting the year off to a start. We will be back. Now we're shifting from fourth Monday, uh, this year to first Mondays uh, in 2022. And so our first, um, our first underscored uh, program of the new year will be on February 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we hope you'll all enjoy uh, and join us. Um, and um, we wish you all a very happy holiday and a healthy one. Uh, we hope for a more normal world in 2022. Um, I'm told that we may be um, seeing the credits roll uh, after our Q&A, um, but I'm not sure about that. So whatever happens when we sign off, uh, I want to thank you, Sebastian, again for joining us. Thank you, and thanks for the wonderful performance. Thank you. A pleasure always. Thanks to all of our viewers out there for joining us. And whether you see credits or not at this point, um, have a wonderful holiday. We'll see you again in the new year. <laughs>